So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the roundtable recording in progress. Entitled uh, "Inequalities in the Connected World." So we are uh, preparing. We've been preparing for an open discussion and organizing this uh, wonderful conference. We thought that we could probably exploit uh, the synergies uh, that the wonderful keynotes today are about inequalities. So um, we're going to focus on inequalities in the context of connections because the two trends that are really um, uh, prevailing in today's society is inequalities, as we know, and the connections that are stronger and uh, more global than, than ever before. So we're going to discuss these trends with excellent panelists and let me introduce these panelists. Uh, let's start with the ladies first. So we have Annie Dubati from Swansea University. So Annie is a senior lecturer in economics and uh, she is uh, the pioneer of cultural based development theory. And she uh, has received uh, recently the Dilby Medal for her work on cultural biases, inequality, and uh, uh, discrimination. So welcome, uh, Annie. Um, we have Katarzyna Kopczewska from Uni University of Warsaw. She is an associate professor of uh, spatial economics and econometrics. She is pioneering uh, uh, new methods uh, connected to spatial econometrics. And she is the EOC member of the ERSA and the editor of Regional Science Policy and Practice. So welcome, Kathy. Uh, we have uh, Joachim, van, uh, Joachim van Dijk from the University of Groningen. Uh, uh, Joachim is a professor of uh, regional market analysis and uh, he uh, has been uh, the uh, previous editor of papers in regional science uh, as well as um, he is an uh, RSAI fellow and the previous president of ERSA and he just received the Hirota Dakono Award for his uh, outstanding uh, contribution to our scientific community. And last but not least, uh, we have Andres Rodriguez Pose with us, uh, who is a professor of economic geography at the London School of Economics. And he is the director of the Canada Blanche Center, which is a center for social innovation and uh, uh, for strengthening connections between the UK and Spain. And he has um, provided our, our community with outstanding contributions on inequalities, uh, on the role of institutions, and places that don't matter. Um, and he's the editor of Economic Geography and won the ERSA Prize on, uh, in 2018 in, in regional science. So welcome, all of you, and thank you very much for accepting the invitation. My name is Balázs Lengyel. I am a uh, Senior Research Fellow at the Ötves Lorand Research Institute in Budapest, and my uh, research interest is in, in social networks or networks in general and how they play a role in, in uh, regional development. So um, the plan for, for today is that we have a more or less fixed schedule on, uh, with planned questions that we, go, that we will go through and then uh, we plan to have enough uh, room and time for your questions as well. So I encourage you to, to uh, develop your questions and participate in this open discussion, all right? So um, uh, let me first start uh, with a very general question, which is about the areas and spatial scales of inequalities. So uh, what do you think, what are the most prevalent uh, scales uh, and examples of uh, uh, income inequalities? Um, I think we can, we can have a round uh, starting with Andres. Well, thank you very much, Valas. I was not expecting to start, but I'm happy to do it. Um, thanks all too for being here. You're asking a question that is, how 
does inequality and at which scale do we need to look at inequality? I think any scale works, but I'm not going to be just stay there. I'm going to be much more concise. What we have seen is that uh, it was mentioned by Michael Storper this morning that at the world scale, what we have had has been uh, a reduction of interpersonal inequality. That many people living in emerging countries through globalization, through greater connectivity, what they have done is they have improved and they have improved significantly, apart from those at the very, very bottom, their quality of life relative to where they were three, four, five decades ago. Uh, the ones that seem to be losing in this sort of Branko Milanovic type of um, elephant curve are the middle classes in the developed world. And uh, of course, at the top end, we all saw that's the trunk of the elephant that they're doing very well. So probably the global scale is missing a lot of the point. It's great that we're reducing inequalities, but the ones that are creating the most economic and uh, political problems at the moment are those that seem to be losing out in relative terms. And that's where we have to go at what's happening within countries and what is happening within regions. And there what we are seeing is that although at the global scale there's this reduction within many countries in the world, there has been significant polarization. Concentration in places like Budapest, for example, relative to not just the rural areas of Hungary, but Pech or Debrecen or Szeged and other cities here. Uh, France, for example, is the case. We're seeing the massive polarization in the US between the two coasts and the center. So that dimension is becoming very important and is politically expedient. But we should not forget the inter-regional dimension that at the moment is not politically expedient because it hasn't exploded, but most inequalities happen within our regions. In the case of Europe, 70% of inequalities are within region, 15% are within countries, and 15% are across countries. So this is something that is bigger at the level of within region, that it might not have exploded yet because um, there might be stronger spillovers within regions than across regions. So poor people benefit from spillovers from having a concentration of wealth there, but this might not last for the long term. And we need to make sure that we find solutions to the rise of inequalities within regions and also within our countries, but from a territorial perspective. So, does any one of you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my view on scale is a little bit radical, <laughs> perhaps. I don't think that scale matters at all. I think um, inequality is a problem of fairness, which arises in any part of society. So depending on who is facing the problem, whether we want to uh, help the local authority or we want to help the country or so on and so forth, we have to, to be able to answer the question how it originated and how we can improve the situation, right? So um, then the proper way to cut through um, uh, inequality is to see uh, the source of it. And the source of it can be the behavior of people. So people might be discriminating and therefore they create a bias in their choices. Uh, or uh, it can be institutions that are discriminating. And the second type is much more obviously uh, regional much more obviously uh, more powerful, so more sticky than the individual one, um, at least more difficult to turn around in a particular moment in time. Um, but uh, then both types, both the individual bias and the institutional uh, bias, taste for discriminating one group over another, in the end of the day is inspired by a taste for discrimination, and this is something cultural you have the taste to discriminate another group. There should be groups in order to discriminate between them. And uh, there should be something that is empowering you to think that you can discriminate against the other. And this thing is called culture. And culture exists only on some kind of above individual level. So by its nature, it is a regional thing. So as regional economists, we, we define region always broadly. We're interested from cities to, you know, even from neighborhoods to cities to uh, regions, and then we can compare even countries and think of it still in some kind of. So the cause of inequality should be considered a regional thing, which is culture, or at least an aggregate thing, which is culture. 
then it can be implemented by individual biases or by institutions. And then we can see how it plays and puts all our system and the talks of the keynotes very much uh, in place because uh, they're talking about um, technology and technology is something which is decided based on your fears, your uncertainty, and uncertainty is curved by culture, right? Uh, then there is a lot of research now on uh, patenting and innovation in the States by Stephanie Stanchev and her husband and the, the group. What they're saying, they're saying taxation seems to be something which is going counter the innovation. What is taxation? It is an extractive behavior of the institutions. Right? So again, the culture of the institutions. So this is, I think, the, um, the useful way to, to cut ar <laughs> around through this ball of inequalities. If you look at our uh, program here at uh, ERSA, we have 40 papers. 20 of them are talking about inequality, and then the other 20 are talking about inequalities. Okay? So this understanding that there is a plurality in this, uh, in this problem, of course, of course, you can smear it by just saying, oh, it's a complex thing, but then complex things have to be reduced in the correct way so that the complexity is understandable and manageable. So that's my proposition from cultural and regional economic point of view. So. Um, yeah, when, when starting my, my uh, points of view, uh, just to remind, I'm, I'm quantitative. Yeah? So all my perspectives are usually go through the uh, from the perspective, how we count the things and how, how we calculate and how, how the measurement matters for the outcome, which is quite important. Um, and uh, the second thing is that I, I decided to be somehow provocative uh, during this panel and not to concentrate on what is in the literature and in our research, but what is not and what is somehow missing uh, probably from very different perspectives. So um, yeah, that, that applies to all my answers. Um, but going to the first question, which is uh, in fact on spatial scales and, um, uh, and, and our approach to, to, to measure and, and, uh, and deal with that. Yeah, first of all, I, I wanted to say about the, um, not about the regional uh, or inter international uh, studies which are uh, uh, majoring uh, in, in spatial uh, or in inequalities, but uh, rather about those which are appearing. Yeah? So recently, many uh, studies come um, using nightlight data uh, and also daily data uh, with the photos, and they start to deal with inequalities. And I think that this is something amazing and um, just opening new paths for the research. Uh, because the new scale, the spatial scale is appearing, yeah? so we are not anymore uh, analyzing a region which is like 200 kilometers or 400 kilometers, but we go to pixels or grids which are like 300 meters or one kilometer. And that really matters for the outcome and uh, for the new perspectives. So, uh, so this is something which is very interesting. As, as uh, Balash introduced me, I'm, I'm re um, editor in Regional Science Policy and Practice, and right now is uh, appearing uh, the special issue on nightlight uh, indicators of regional development, uh, which is for, um, uh, for, for, um, for, for Chile, for Thailand, for Russia, and for Poland, uh, just to analyze um, inequalities uh, in mobility, in poverty, and uh, in well-being. So these are the things which are really coming. But talking about the um, different or other aspects of spatial scale, yeah, one of the important things is the aggregation. Uh, yeah, during the, the first uh, today keynote, um, uh, Michael Storper was saying about talking about Gini coefficient. Um, we should remember that Gini coefficient has two drawbacks. The, the, the first drawback is that it is based on the mean, mean value. Um, and as I will later say, um, it's not that obvious that we have a very good mean value for many of the territories. Um, and secondly, uh, it is a non-absolute measure in terms that many people say, okay, that whatever I take, or countries, or regions, or communities, I can compare Gini. It is not true. So Gini is very, very sensitive to the aggregation. And the bias might be even 20%. So uh, we cannot compare in, within regions and between nations with the Gini, because uh, just because of the nature of that measure, we, make, uh, we may make a, 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 a bias, a mistake of 20%. So that is quite important when we, when we talk about inequalities, because Gini is still like a number one in, in analysis. Second point is that um, we have like a local inequality and global inequality, which is very, very visible. So we have like a technological competition between 
America, Europe, China. And this is the global inequality. And of course, we can look at the uh, cities, communities, which are well, well, better developed, well developed, uh, less developed. And that is something very, very different. Different mechanisms, different special scales, and so on. So this is something which we should um, um, uh, co consider and distinguish. And the consequence of that is a spatial heterogeneity. Um, yeah, I'm a spatial econometrician, yeah, and, and the spatial econometrics is since 20 years or 30 years or 50 years concentrating on spatial autocorrelation, so similarity, which is distance decaying, so or, or attenuating. And um, right now, what is many people stress, yeah, that if we have spatial heterogeneity, we should address it somehow. Yeah, we, we shouldn't treat the the, 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 uh, the territories equally. Um, and um, in fact, what we do in, in um, research on, uh, on inequalities, we think that there is like a one word, one benchmark, and we calculate the average. We say who is on the top, who is on the bottom, and then we say uh, to the policy, okay, let's do something that those worst, we'll catch up with those best, which is the convergence, uh, and then we implement the policy, which is not necessarily true because of this diversity which exists. In fact, the much deeper ontological problem which is assigned, attached to that is um, something which is quite, quite right now popular in the literature, whether we are Gaussian or Pareton which Gaussians with those who think that we are in the normal distribution and the world is additive and um, the, the features are ind independent. Or Paretian, yeah, and Paretian think, okay, we have like two speeds, yeah, the, the, the stars and the rest in the proportion 20, 80 percent or, or something similar. Um, and we should accept this diversity and not force or squeeze this uh, diversity into some uniform distribution. And this is the, for me, this is a fundamental question in studying inequalities, uh, which benchmark we prefer. Of course, this, this has very deep political implications. If we allow or um, accept that some will be simply, simply uh, slower, worse, uh, permanently, uh, or should we somehow push them up? Yeah, but this, this is the, the question which is, I, I would say, missing still in the literature. So, um, and that is connected to spatial heterogeneity. And from technical point, yeah, um, if you have spatial heterogeneity, that means that the variance of uh, is, is very high. And what does it mean for uh, econometricians? Your uh, p-value <laughs> will be quite high because when you have high variance, many of the variables become insignificant. So that makes the conclusions usually that that this some pattern is not important, significant, uh, impacting some uh, the, the equal, in, in inequality problem. Yeah? It may impact, yeah? but we should, if we consider this uh, spatial heterogeneity, this output um, looks very, very similar. Yeah? And that's why, I'm, I'm, as I said, I will be provocative, because I think that we should um, somehow switch between being Gaussian, which was, I, I would say, in the majority of the papers I, I, I observed, or being Paretian, which is uh, like a very, very new coming trend uh, in, in regional research. Thank you. Okay, a, a lot has been said. Uh, I try to add, uh, add something. Uh, my field is uh, regional labor markets, and labor markets in itself are uh, small scale because it's limited by commuting distance. On the other hand, you want to compare between regional labor markets, so that also matters. And of course, there is migration and commuting. Uh, a lot of uh, research in regional science focuses on migration and some on commuting. Uh, but what uh, a lot of people don't know is that um, most people are sticky. They stay in their region uh, forever and they don't move at all. And I think we do not study that very much. We focus more on the mobility part than on the sticky, uh, on the sticky part. Uh, but re with regard to the spatial scale, I think spatial scale uh, matters. Andres has written a paper about um, uh, places that don't matter, but there are also persons that don't matter. And it's related sometimes and sometimes it's not. Uh, when you look, for instance, at the Netherlands, it's a small country. Uh, it's 300 kilometers when you go from, from north to, to south. Uh, but we see in statistics, if you want to discover uh, equalities, that uh, if you divide the country in four parts, then over the last 20 years, uh, 25 years, you see that regional differences are uh, almost uh, disappearing, uh, uh, disappeared. But when you look at the more detailed scale within these four parts of the country, then the uh, differences are increasing. 
And it's at two parts. It's uh, within the cities, and it's between the rural and urban areas. And these problems are, are completely different, and you have to look at it very, very carefully, uh, because uh, you can boom uh, a, a city, but it doesn't mean that all the people who live in the city uh, all benefit from it. And on the other hand, you have uh, regions which are a little, a little bit farther away, where people live, uh, and they, they are losing their jobs, and new jobs are not coming in, and they are immobile. The mobile people, they move to the cities. But the people who remain, this is one of the big, big problems. And uh, I think it's a very sticky problem, because uh, in, in my department, we've done a lot of research uh, by using micro data, where you can follow uh, career patterns over 25 years, uh, or even some, sometimes longer. And then you see very sticky uh, uh, and persistent differences. Uh, people from certain regions, they all uh, are lagging behind in their, in their income and in their opportunities to, to find a job. And that's very, very persistent. So it's a combination of, of the spatial scale, uh, the history, and the individual and the regional characteristics uh, which need to be studied more in detail, and especially uh, the sticky part, because we focus, I think, too much on the uh, dynamic part. Well, thank you very much uh, for your very diverse answers. Uh, I really like the richness of uh, and the variety of, of your approaches. So you mentioned the um, several uh, layers of inequalities and uh, um, various scales that, that inequalities prevail at. Um, but you, you do mention that inequalities and the roots, the causes of inequalities are local and they also prevail at, at larger scales, so they are inter-regional and of course are across countries. And I really, really like the, the approach of Michael Storper's uh, talk today on the, on the fractal nature of inequalities, which is a very good example, I think, on, on the complexity that, that we face. So um, turning to the second focus of our, uh, um, uh, uh, our roundtable, I would love to hear about the, your opinion about how connections matter and at what scales do connections matter uh, in inequality? So um, in this brieflet uh, that we planned our roundtable around, uh, before I formulated like two, it's not a contrasting view, but two approaches uh, that connections might, uh, might influence inequalities. Of course, in, in the very influential paper of Simone Ian Marino, Andres Rodriguez Pozzi, and Michael Storper, um, it, it, as I read it, uh, connections do not really help to mitigate inequalities because the connections across sp places or within places e uh, either, they uh, can only uh, compensate very, as I like, they can hardly compensate for for uh, the, the uh, advantages that they provide for the more advanced places. So that's one, that's one approach that we can, uh, we can borrow from, uh, from that paper. However, on the local scale, uh, emp empirical studies uh, found very recently that connections, social connections mostly, matter to mitigate uh, divergence uh, in cities or regions. So I would love to hear your, uh, uh, your take on this. And uh, like, uh, we can keep in mind that connections are very complex and, and a multi-layer phenomena. So there are many, many types of connections. And uh, yeah, yeah, so what, what do you think about this? Yeah, please. Now you hear me? I prepared to dominate the discussion, <laughs> but uh, you know, serendipity. So, um, I think that uh, connections are a derivative of culture, and I think I'm not alone in thinking so. Adam Smith was telling us that uh, we relate to things uh, with which we have cultural proximity, right? So um, this is because by having cultural proximity, we can extend each other's utility from, from living. If you like a poem, and I like a poem, when I start having my utility decreasing, by you coming around and 
enjoying this poem, you extend my utility. And then this holds on in everything that we are doing. This, this is how on the basis of culture we connect. The cultural proximity lets us make our little clubs. And then we want the world to look the way we like it. And our club fights with the other club, which has a little bit different kind of preferences. And then this kind of different preferences and different arrangements of the world indeed create the heterogeneity that you're talking about and that be it spatial or being anything, you have to ac account for it and you have to, to seriously take into consideration. If you don't consider, however, the cultural element, you first underspecify the model because you're under -qu quantifying one of the main sources of uh, the, the process. So any uh, model that is not taken into consideration a particular important element is under uh, specified. And then uh, also uh, you are um, not giving an answer why. So the power law, the tip law, it exists everywhere. And Herbert Simon was one of the first to, to tell us about this um, and um, in the original science we adopted it from there. But uh, the question is, if you have a power law in the growth of cities, and you have a power law in the growth of the exposure to, um, um, to water disaster, right? So is it just the size of these things? Or is it some relationship between them? Is it because people go near the water so that the cities are the, the places that will have the ecological problem and will have, um, you know, hard trouble with, um, um, with um, ecological problems if they're bigger cities, right? So, and we know from econometrics that we can establish causality if we know the timing of things. And culture is something which over time evolves slower, so that's why the connections and the culture which is behind them, drives all the, the, the inequality and all the other process, economic processes uh, which are related to this. And last remark about the measurement. Uh, we do not um, pay attention to many things which are already out there. Because this tip flow, this power law, actually was um, uh, first found in language. And language expresses the way we think, right? So then, uh, perhaps what dominates our way of thinking, which places dominate our uh, our discourse, are the places that draw more people, and from there the the, the whole uh, process can be expected to be related because there is the, the power law is just a statistical fact. It's not an explanation why things happen in this way, and we have to answer to this empirically, and then perhaps create some kind of a more theoretical. <laughs> explanation about the economic process. Okay, um, for me, uh, when I was thinking about that question, because we, we, we knew the questions, yes, uh, um, as, as Balash asked, yeah, so economic interactions, yeah, but interactions between what, yeah, and also we had like a, a bullet point on uh, physical connectivity, mobility, trade, global value chains, social and collaboration networks, and so on and so on. Yeah? So I said, uh, okay, which one to choose? Yeah? And I, I, personally, I found out that um, we as economists are, I would say in majority, of course, not everybody, but we still belong uh, to the reductionists. So we like to find one criteria and go smoothly. Yeah? So Gini, um, GDP or income and like one single type of, uh, of interactions. Um, the question is if, if we are right, yeah? so if we pick up the proper one. Um, and this uh, reductionist way of thinking um, is, is something contrary to the complex way of thinking. Uh, I, I'm much closer to this complex one, and uh, of course it is not making things easier, yeah? <laughs> it is to make your life harder, in fact, but probably much closer to the, uh, to the reality. So um, if, if, you, if we look to the uh, literature, but very cold, yeah? not, not very engaged that we, 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 pro we, we are just in favor of some solution, we see that there are so many s approaches, yeah? and each of them is saying something different, yeah? so that this reductionist approach is, is not very efficient in, in uh, explaining the world. Um, and something which I really like from the recent literature is uh, the third law of geography. Of course, everybody remembers the first law of geography. I guess it is cited in, in, in thousands of papers by the, the law by Waldo Tobler from 1970. 
um, which was in fact about the spatial autocorrelation. Yeah? So that's is, is, is well known. Yeah? Then, then, then there was the, the second law of geography by the good child yeah, in 2004. It was much more on spatial heterogeneity. And the third law of geography, uh, which is quite fresh because it, it has just four years, uh, Zhu and the colleagues from 2018, they promote um, this complexity, just to think uh, multi-criteria. Um, and that changes a lot the perspective. Yeah? So we, um, yeah, that is much closer to the, to the perception of economists that all the answers start with the sentence, it depends. Yeah? So then it depends and we, we can't include all possible factors. Um, but this multidimensional approaching of different relations and different uh, interactions makes our perspective much more um, comprehensive. In fact, this is much closer to propensity score matching. Yeah? Uh, so this third law of geography says, okay, um, for implementation of the policy, we should find like a twins. So find a region which has very similar feature in many terms, and if we see some outcomes in that region, um, so then if we, um, if we will implement uh, some policy in very similar region, we can expect very similar outcomes. Um, and I, I would say that this is something which we should incorporate in our thinking, this multidimensional uh, thinking about the relations and, uh, and, and, and connections, uh, not just like a very flat picture of the, of the reality, uh, but, but very multidimensional, which again uh, allows us coming back to spatial heterogeneity because um, different relations uh, differ due to the economic, to spatial scales, yeah, so that, that is well connected to the first question. So there are different um, uh, interactions when we um, consider mobility um, or commuting to the work, much different relations when, when we talk about the culture, because it's much wider, even different connections when we talk about the trade, which is usually national, and so on, so on. So, um, yeah, I, I will answer as, as a typical economist. It, it depends, and w let's look at the deeper, at the complexity, not the simplicity. Okay. Thank you. Um, in my view, um, a connectivity is, is, of course, very important. Uh, it's very good that you can move from one region to another physically, or that you have the connections in a digital way. So no doubt about that. Uh, but the next question is, who uses it, and how is it used, and, and how do you value it? Uh, because different groups have different access uh, to, to different uh, modes of connectivity. Uh, it might be because of uh, 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 that, that they don't have the skills to, to use it, or they don't have the money to, to use it. And that makes a difference in, in how it works out. <clears throat> and also in, in a regional way. To mention an example, I live in the north of the Netherlands and there is now a debate about a high-speed train from Amsterdam to Groningen. Now, there has been, uh, as usual, a cost-benefit analysis. And then it turns out that there is a very negative effect. Of course, you have the cost of the train. Uh, but also the agglomeration effects are very negative. Uh, when you move, uh, have a high-speed high rail, and some people should move to the north of the Netherlands, it lowers uh, the agglomeration effect in Amsterdam much more than it increases it in the north. Is this realistic? Because if you turn it around, that implies that everyone should live in Amsterdam because agglomeration effects are infinitive. And this morning we had uh, Michael Storper. He was a more or less uh, saying that if you have bigger cities, then you have more innovation. But in the end, does it also lead to more uh, inequality? Because he mentioned examples of big firms. All these big firms have one very rich owner. Uh, and how does it spread out to other people? So if you have an other idea that you want to uh, value that economic activities and access to jobs is more equally spread over the country, uh, that means that you have to have other assumptions about agglomeration effects. Because if you think from welfare perspective, spreading is good, and then it's, 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 diff it's very strange that if you do a cost-benefit analysis with agglomeration effects that uh, the costs are enormous. So how, how do we do, what are the optimum uh, agglomeration effects uh, and, and where, and of course we have the, the argument of borrowed size, how far does, does, does this go? And uh, uh, most of these agglomeration effects uh, are counting in terms of GDP. Uh, but if you have broader well-being indicators, it might be a different way. So how do we deal with this 
with uh, in the end having in mind that we want also more equal opportunities uh, and more equality for households and individuals who live in different regions. How do we cope to this? And I have doubts that uh, what um, uh, Michael Stormer said, that, that we need more Amazons, etc., will solve this problem. On the other hand, he has a good, uh, I think you need money to do something, so you have to generate the money. But for instance, in the European Union, it's very difficult for governments to have taxes uh, from this, uh, to, to get money from uh, the, the revenues they earn. Now, how, is, is this an economic problem? Is this uh, an institutional problem? How, how do we cope with this? I'll try to not repeat many of the things, good, very good things that have been said before, but the, the main question is, does connectivity matter for inequality? And of course the answers would be yes, but I think we need to define what is connectivity and what do we understand by connectivity. And I'm a much less complex person than Katarzyna here, so I'm going to, rather than having a more, let's say, cultural definition of uh, um, connectivity, like for example, the one that was uh, proposed by uh, uh, Annie here, what I'll propose is I'm going to focus on just economic connectivity, the one that we can measure by trade or we can measure by investment, etc. And in reply to your question, the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, it's, uh, we're not risk covering the wheel. You have to go back to, I mean, there's work already in the 1980s and 1990s, but uh, the, probably the best known work is that of uh, David Author, uh, Author and his co-authors on what they call the China shock. The idea that uh, trading with China, but with other East and Southeast Asian countries, had significant implications for certain types of employment in the case of the US. But this is something that Simona Yamarino, Luisa Gagliardi, and myself, when we look at offshoring and outsourcing in the case of the UK, we find that on the whole, outsourcing and offshoring has been positive for the UK, but it has led to massive destruction of jobs mainly manufacturing low-skilled or mid-skilled jobs in the north of England and to a significant creation of jobs in the south of England, thus triggering greater polarization. I'm now working with uh, one of my PhD students, Martina Pardi, on we have now data on trade across regions in Europe. And what we find that also is not just global in, uh, trade, we're finding that in the case of Europe overall, and this is an average, that any type of trade increases inequality but it's proximity trade, trade with other regions in your country, to a greater extent that trade with other regions in Europe, uh, and to a greater extent that with trade to other regions in the world, in contrast to the China sort of uh, shock argument, that actually leads to greater inequality. So more interaction within, for example, Hungary, on average, would probably lead to greater concentration in Budapest than having much greater inter interaction with other parts of the world. So the question is, we have a problem, and connectivity leads to greater inequality. So what do we deal? And there are two solutions. We can either deal with a connectivity problem, or we can deal with, if there's a problem, or we can deal with an inequality problem. And I would be completely against any sort of intervention on connectivity. Why? Because uh, regardless of all its problems, uh, globalization has led to probably the best level of well-being across any part of the world, where we, whether we are developed or less developed, than we have ever experienced in history. I will challenge you, despite the talk by Simona of modern slavery, etc., to tell me how many, what's the percentage of people or places in the world that are actually worse off than they were four or five decades ago, in absolute terms because inequality is a relative term, so you might be less well off than your neighbor was 40 years ago, but you're better off, you and your neighbor are better off. So the idea is probably we don't need to intervene on integration, we probably need greater integration, especially because it brings well-being, and it brings welfare, and it brings wealth, the wealth that uh, Jauke was talking about, uh, Michael Storper was talking about this morning. So we need to focus on why are some people and some places not capable of benefiting from this greater connectivity. And that's where we need to implement or go beyond the one-size-fits-all. Because if we do one-size-fits-all, the same are going to benefit all the time. If we do more sensitive type of policies, which are 
place sensitive but people sensitive, sometimes they're going to be the same, sometimes they might differ. What we might address is why the causes or the root causes of why we have pockets of poverty, pockets of inequality being concentrated in certain groups of people and in certain places, and how to make sure that these benefits actually reach these people and that these people can make the most of any future benefits of connectivity. Oh, thank you so much um, for your very thought-provoking insights. So, um, <clears throat> Um, I would like to continue with, with the next question and make the connection with your insights. And uh, the connection is knowledge diffusion and, and innovation. So I think we arrived to, to the point um, where we can talk about the uh, increasing returns to scale that provide uh, advantages uh, in, in large cities for companies and then innovation concentrates in big cities and that's where development happens. So, um, completely agree, uh, agreeing with uh, Andrea's last thoughts, uh, the question is how the, the rest and, and those people who are located outside of these centers can benefit from, from, the, from, from these uh, uh, advances and then uh, the, the, uh, uh, how, how they could do it is of course that the knowledge that is produced in large cities is, can diffuse across places. So what do you think? Uh, do the recent technological developments or the ch changes that we are, we are facing and we are experiencing that we move to a more and more online uh, uh, communication uh, behavior and we keep contact with, with everybody. So what do you think we can theoretically, but we do not. So uh, uh, what's your take on, on, on this uh, on the role of technological development and uh, connections and inequalities? Uh, yeah, we, we decided that next person is starting, yeah, so right now it's my turn. <laughs> Um, yeah, for, for me, this uh, technological change is, uh, again, quite serious question. Of course, this is the, the, the question of, of global inequality, as, as we heard, yeah? so, to, so this is the, the, this race between continents, in fact, in, in, um, in development. And as Michael Stopper said, um, yeah, we have like a technological uh, stars from US. Um, and they are not imitated in, in or, or we don't have this equivalence in, in Europe. Yeah? So, so that was the, the message which I took uh, from the from the morning keynote speech, um, and in fact that is um, just going on the on the on the way which I was also previously mentioning whether we are Gaussian operating, um, yeah. Because if we think that the technological change is something and technological startups, uh, innovative firms which become the stars is, is something which obviously will happen, um, but we have to just work on that simply. Yeah? So we have to work on the absorption, give some money, uh, make the proper climate for that, uh, institutional, cultural, financial, innovativeness, agglomeration effects, and, and hundreds we know. Yeah? Um, th th that is the, the, in this word of, of, of Gaussian uh, Gaussian approach. But uh, if we go Paretian, yeah, we, we, we treat this um, uh, the events which are of very low probability and extremely high impact, yeah? and they are so called in the in the long tail of the distribution. Yeah? So those who are Gaussian, they, they they say it's so the probability is so low that we shouldn't take care of that, yeah, because it is just beyond three sigma. Um, and those who are Paretian say, okay, let's look mostly at details um, that something might happen. Uh, but it's very, very unsure and very, very uh, low probable. So um, that impacts the policy we run. Because if we think Gaussian, yeah, we, 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 we put everything to this average. Yeah? And if we have like di very strong diversity, uh, that, so like low innovativeness mostly or predominantly in 80% of regions, and uh, superstars, which are definitely a minority. Um, so if we take the average, which is like a fundamental concept of, of being Gaussian. That means that this average re responds to nothing. Yeah? This is not, nobody's average, not, not, neither of those poor, neither of those rich. Um, and then we try to implement the policy which is positioning everybody towards this means. And, and, and probably, yeah, the question is if this is the right policy. 
if we go uh, so-called Paretian, yeah, so with the long tails, yeah, we accept diversity. This is the first first issue, and this is the question to ask to researchers, to policymakers, to citizens. Uh, if we accept diversity, um, but then um, it, the policy is d definitely different. Yeah? Just to concentrate on this long tail and uh, the, the situation that the, the uh, technology will emerge, yeah? but that is, uh, the probability of that is very, very low. Yeah? But if that happens, yeah, the returns, so the profit profitability, um, is, is extremely high. Yeah? And this is like an engine for, for, uh, for the development. Um, so, in fact, this um, Paretian way of thinking is um, much more popular in terms of game changers. So that the Google was a game changer yeah, in, 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 in a moment. Yeah? The Netflix was a game changer. Um, so, in fact, these are the very, very uh, st there is strong evidence yeah, that still it, it's the world might be some, somehow Paretian, yeah, even if we still think Gaussian. So, um, in, in fact, um, that is, uh, I would say, the missing part in the in the literature. If we assume that uh, this diversity exists, we don't accept the mean. So, or, or we have a, a mean for the group of poor and the group of, of stars, and then we adjust the policy. Yeah? So, somehow policy f suiting the or fitted to the uh, to the conditions. Um, so. For, for me, this is the, the fundamental issue in, in, the, in the research on the technological progress and also on the, on the regional policy. Um, and um, that also um, implies that we should think differently about the methods. Um, I, I'm happy to be in spatial econometrics, but also in spatial machine learning. Those who still are thinking that the spatial weights matrix is the only component or spatial component um, may not know that um, when you go to um, machine learning, you, 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 you don't have to be linear. So machine learning mostly is being nonlinear. So you can accept um, exponential relations, uh, not, not necessarily um, impact of variables at every level of this variable. That is something which happens, yeah, that for low level the, the variable or there is no, no relation and for high level value of variable there is a relation. Yeah? So that is possible in, in machine learning and that, that's why the predictions from machine learning are much better. I, I suppose this is a quite common knowledge yeah, that if you predict from the um, linear models like OLS or spatial models, have you ever seen a very good prediction or for technology no yeah because those predictions are not not matching the reality mostly and, and some of which is coming yeah these are the machine learning models but this is not just the technical te technical novelty that machine learning is trendy yeah? but this is this this is expressing some much deeper thinking about how the world looks like and and if we uh, if we can um, better model the the reality so for me this is uh, this is the major point uh, in distinguishing or, or talking about this technology because for me technology is uh, very Paretian and very machine learning approach to model and to go that path to be successful in, in, uh, in understanding those, those concepts. Yeah, yeah te technological development, communication technologies, of course, they are big game changers in our, uh, our society. And uh, the effects are, are mixed also on inequality. Uh, I, yesterday I, uh, evening, I read the conference book and uh, it was noted uh, that the online ERSA conference uh, of uh, the, the last one where nobody could be physical present uh, had an equal distribution of uh, males and females. It was the first one. And maybe because it uh, was hybrid that it was easier for women to have access because they travel less. Uh, now, that can be uh, a positive point. Also, people who come from uh, poor countries, uh, they have access to, to conferences. Now, uh, it's accessible by uh, uh, online. On the other hand, we are all very happy that we can see each other alive. So, how do you cope with that in the future? But these effects I mentioned are positive. So, how, how do you deal and how, how do you find the right mix? Another issue is um, differences between people. Some people can, uh, can use and catch up with new technologies uh, and are able to use it, and others are not. And uh, that may increase inequalities for those who are in and out. 
And I think that also requires that uh, technological progress uh, and communication technology need another step. And that uh, they focus more on that people who are now excluded can use it. For instance, elderly people, they can be uh, helped by robotization, but sometimes they don't know how to operate it. So you have to yell to a machine, make me coffee, and then the machine should do that, and you don't have to press anything, no, he should do that. And that's the next step in, uh, in technologies, and then it really helps also the people who don't have access now, and then it may reduce inequality. The final aspects I will mention uh, about communication technology, that it can also be disruptive and dangerous with fake news uh, and uh, give easy platforms to all kinds of people uh, with uh, ideas which are uh, maybe not as, uh, as common as, we should, uh, uh, as it should be. And, and they, they have a platform and easy can organize all kinds of different movements. And uh, I would consider that as a, as a negative effect on, uh, on inequality. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to start with the same position as uh, Jauke, saying I think that we're all in the table and all here agree that more technological progress and more innovation is good. Uh, it does help solve problems, everyday life problems. It does help increase well-being and welfare of people wherever they are. Are. It may create other problems down the line, but it normally is a way of solving problems. The question is how do we achieve that greater innovation and what are the implications for inequality? And we can do it in different ways. There was one way that was proposed uh, by Michael Storper this morning. There's a good idea for not just world leading, but uh, really massive companies. The sort of Googles, uh, well, Alphabet now, the, the Metas or Facebooks, the Amazons of the world, uh, why doesn't, and although he says that uh, we're not doing that in Europe, every time I go to the European Commission and I go to DG Innovation, they are always asking me, why don't we produce the new Meta? Or why don't we produce the new uh, Tesla? And the answer is we're not producing the new Tesla probably because we don't want to produce the new Tesla, or we're doing it, going it the wrong way, or we haven't got the scale. But we are producing IKEA, which is world leading in furniture, and coming from the middle of nowhere. We got the largest, uh, let's say, textile company in the world in Inditex, from Artesio in Galicia, coming from the middle of nowhere. And the biggest success during the pandemic did not come from the Silicon Valley. It came from BioNTech, which is a spin-off, and I'm sorry someone feels offended, from the University of Mainz, which is a very good and very decent university, but by no means the best university in Europe or in Germany, and in not the biggest city in the world. So there are other ways of achieving innovation, and the way of going for the big firms rather than for a more, let's say, spread, incremental type of innovation with firms that might not be as big, but might have a significant change, might be better as a way to prevent the rise of, in, uh, the rise of inequality and to prevent stunting innovation in the future, because this year there have been more books published about the future or the current US Civil War than there have been in the whole history of the United States put together because the level of inequality is great at getting to levels that they are difficult to control. And in Europe, we are in, this, in between these two situations. First, there's a problem. We don't have, in terms of generating technological change and innovation, a single integrated market like the US. We lack the scale. Is that good or bad? Well, it's different. It's not necessarily better or worse. It might lead to different models. But we have countries that have tried to pursue that sort of model. Let's concentrate on the big city. Let's put all the research facilities all in the core. And they're not doing particularly well. I'm thinking about the case of France, where you have been discussing in France for about Paris and the French desert for a long time. We have the case of, for example, uh, the UK, where I work, where I lived for a long time, and which is in a real mess as a result of the current polarization, also in terms of innovation, between London and the Southeast, mainly Oxford and Cambridge, and the rest of the country. 
By contrast, what we have is Germany. And of course, Germany is not devoid of problems. But in Germany, innovation is not concentrated on research and technological progress are not concentrated in Berlin, or they're not concentrated in the Ruhr, the largest agglomeration. They are spread throughout the country, in some places more than in others. But it allows for mines to generate biotech, for Freiburg to be a world leader, Freiburg, a hundred and I don't know how many thousand people, to be a world leader in pharmaceuticals. For places like, it might be a bit old system, like Ingolstadt, to be a, probably the front runner for a long time in Auto making. Places like, I don't know the name, I don't remember the main name right now, a village not that far away from Nuremberg to be the home of Adidas and Puma. So, and what you have is a situation where that sort of diffusion of centers of, on the one hand, innovation, but also centers of research, are contributing to have a country that is not just territorially more equal, with the exception of uh, parts of East Germany, than most of the countries that I mentioned before, including a lot of European countries, but is also, in terms of interpersonal inequality, more equal than we have seen before. So we can look at two different things, and we can look at different models of how to innovate. But if we go for a model in which the main objectives, and I know that Michael is going to challenge me on this, but what you have is leading firms that are like Meta, Meta Facebook had a level of capitalization that made it much bigger than most other countries, most countries in the world. But until relatively recently had 45,000, that was before the pandemic, uh, 45,000 workers, half of them concentrated in Menlo Park in, um, in, uh, in the Bay Area, so in the Silicon Valley, and virtually no connection through upward and downward linkages that would actually generate any other types of jobs anywhere else in the world. Of course, you can say Facebook is extreme, but let's take Amazon. Amazon, with expansion last year, grew from 900,000 workers to 1.4 million. And Amazon, is, for me, is a great innovation. For many people living in rural areas, is the only sort of service that they get these days. But the problem is, what are the implications in terms of inequality? when you have concentration both uh, of massive amounts of wealth in certain levels of in certain ind individuals, many of whom live in countries that are far away from your own country, uh, who, it was mentioned before, very often don't pay taxes, just pay taxes or part of taxes somewhere, and uh, have a significant knock-on implication on the high streets, for example, not just of the big cities, but medium-sized cities and rural areas, relative to the retail and wholesale service, uh, sorry, the wholesale and uh, retail service in Europe, that in 2019, right before the pandemic, actually employed 30 million people. So we have to look at that Promoting a certain type of model might have implications down, down the line that might lead to perhaps bigger problems than the ones we have now. And this is not to say we don't need innovation. We need a lot of innovation. We need to innovate much more as Europeans, and I agree completely with Michael, we need, if we want to keep our, not just to have a place in the world, but to keep our and afford our quality of life, we need to keep on innovating and becoming richer. But the way we innovate is fundamental in terms of determining not just how unequal we are in the future, but also how prosperous and how capable of innovating we are also in the future. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> You're a very stimulating crowd and I was putting down what I want to say for you. For you. So, uh, starting from where you started. What is the diffusion? Something is a flaw, and it has to pass through a system, right? Through some kind of a network. So then um, we have to understand it as uh, all other flaws. We know a lot about migration flows, trade flows, financial flows. They are attracted by something. There is a gravity. 
something creates the gravity. So in order to understand where things diffuse and how they diffuse, we have to understand which is the center of gravity and there is the cultural gravity hypothesis which exists for that. Um, then this brings us to uh, Andres' uh, point. He was saying, don't touch the connectivity. That's a sacred cow. Try to solve the innovation. And as much as by heart, I fully agree with you. I think that as scientists, we should not say what we have to. I know, having been also with the politicians and the policymakers, that they very much want this from you and they'll eat you up to come up with an answer what we have to. But we can only study things and this makes us more powerful. Because the connectivity is something which is cultural, yes. Politicians don't want to touch culture, yes. It might be dangerous because ideology might pollute it and we may have the dangerous things, but we can study it and we have to understand how this happens and we are in the advantageous point that, that we can just study without taking decisions. Then the decisions have to be taken and by monitoring properly what is going on by the policymakers and they have to be proper policymakers and not beg us as weak policymakers, you know, somebody else to take the responsibility for that. Um, this is how, how I see this. And then this brings me to the question of ideology. And I really loved your constant reference to this Gaussian and Paretian problem. Because <coughs> this is also an ideology in itself, whether you want to think of the world this way or that way. And if the world is complex, then different processes should exist. And the solution to a complex thing is reducing the complexity meaningfully for the system that you are dealing with. So the answer is not always two, <laughs> the answer is sometimes six, the answer, so there are different kinds of steps that will be the solution, but you are always reducing this complexity to something. So sometimes you will have a Gaussian, sometimes you will have a Paretian uh, solution out there. And we have to acknowledge that, and this means that we as an e economic society, regional economists as a group of that, we are much weaker actually as scientists than the sociologists because the sociologists for a very long period of time had acknowledged that when they are observing the world, they introduce their biases. And we very much talk about, oh, we don't, we, we doubt our assumptions, we don't want to be ideological, but I have to know, and things have to be like this. And if we go back through all our presentations through the years, which are now also on record, so you can go see it, we do that all the time. And this is, however, brings me to the, the, to the last point that this is because that's natural. In order to understand the world, in order to make sense of it, we want to reduce uh, it to some categories, to something which is more frequently observable so that we can rely on it, okay? So only then we can, so if we want something to be rare, how we learn about this rare thing? And then if we make policies that things have to be only rare, are they implementable? How many uh, points of big uh, technological revolutions did we have? <laughs> and if we normalize this, will it have the same disruptive effect on the system? And last, um, so everybody here advertised their journal and their special issues, so I'm entitled to do that as well. <laughs> I'm one of the editors of the beautiful uh, uh, yeah, Regional Science Association, European Regional Science Association uh, official journal, Region. Okay? In Region, there is a special issue on uh, the inequalities and different um, ways that culture has uh, created inequality. So if you're thinking now in this direction, please consider region, check the, the calls. There are also other calls that might fit your interest. Um, then, uh, when you're talking about uh, the flaws and how they're related to the connectivity, well, uh, in the um, um, Journal of um, Economic Issues, there is uh, soon coming, um, in March uh, 2023, a special issue about China and trade in China and how uh, it is influenced by the linguistic uh, changes that happened first and then the trade started opening towards. So your question, well, what causes these trade flows to go in a particular is one way uh, answered there. So maybe you'll be interested to, to have a look at this. Uh, and uh, for your last uh, point, about, both about the machine learning, it actually solves nothing. It's just another way of checking the, the world, isn't it? And what determines what we will find, what we'll build, is the biases which are already in the data generation process and the model according to which we will offer the data to the machine. So, well, <laughs> if you do but not... Not linear, uh, but not linear. Uh, not linear, but if you don't have a main component, the machine will not think out, oh, actually, you know what you forgot about. Uh, so, uh, it's all um, created by us last... <laughs> 
and I promise last. Uh, I agree with um, Andres very much that it's dangerous to t touch the connectivity because the connectivity, the existence of culture is something natural. We need it to decrease our uh, fear of our decisions, our fear of interaction, and so on and so forth. So it is indeed, in a way, practically a sacred cow. And the inequality is what we fear. Everybody fears to be on the last place. This also has been, you know, economically <laughs> uh, demonstrated. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, and especially for the very nice advertisement for the journal and the special issue. <laughs>